Good morning, and welcome to Boomer Health at Home. I'm Maggie Arnazian, your host. Today, I'm joined by Megan Gervin, Nursing Supervisor at AmeriCare Medical, Shane Bias, Epidemiologist and Administrator at the Oakland Health Department, and Medical Director, Dr. Russell Foss of the Oakland County Health Department. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. As you can see, everyone is remote today. We are um, practicing social distancing, but we still wanted to give um, some good information about COVID-19 uh, to our community. So I am gonna start with you, Shane. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and the roles you hold currently uh, within the uh, Oakland County Health Department. Good morning. Well, I've been with Oakland County for about uh, 20 years. The last 10 years, I've been uh, an administrator with our nursing services, a bit of a managerial role. But most recent, uh, but earlier, uh, first 10 years of my career here as an epidemiologist. And so with uh, the recent pandemic, I've uh, started to be an epidemiologist again. And I've been working closely with our first responders, our sheriff's department, trying to work with them to prevent, uh, prevent uh, spread within their ranks, making sure that uh, they can stay on duty and they can continue to protect the public safety. And I've been working closely with our population that's been experiencing homelessness. You can imagine when you tell somebody if they're sick or presumed to have COVID-19, go home, self-isolate. Uh, if you're homeless or you uh, live in a shelter, you can't do that. And so I've been working with them and the providers as far as uh, preventing the spread of COVID-19 within that population. Okay, great. Thank you. And Dr. Faust, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role today. Um, I am the medical director for Oakland County Health Division. I've been here for, well, I guess going on two years. So not, not all that long. And I'll tell you, it's a fairly steep learning curve. So in another 10 years, I might have the hang of it. Um, <laughs> I am, um, wow, a lot of hats. So I'm basically responsible for every sick person in Oakland County right now, or that's certainly the way it feels. Wow. Uh, you know, it's just, um, the, there are a lot of moving parts. And so I try to, uh, I try to help the health officer and the director of um, health and human services here. We're in the context of the pandemic, we're responsible for um, being the liaison, the interface between uh, state and federal um, supplies, for example, and policies and uh, local agencies and taking care of the 1.2 million people in Oakland County. And so, for example, um, distributing national stockpiles of supplies, personal protective equipment, masks and what have you, to our frontline first responders, to hospitals, to long-term care facilities, nursing homes, and, and the like. Um, and um, keeping track of positive cases, for example, in the context of this pandemic, um, with our epidemiology team, we have the communicable disease team, which normally is about eight people, and right now has been expanded to about 50 people. So we've redeployed people from other, um, other units or other you know, units within the health division and um, had them retrained as necessary. Many um, are similar to Shane in that they have a master's in public health in their past. And so it takes very little training to get them to kind of redeploy into epidemiology um, positions and, and um, activities. So that's been helpful. And, um, <clears throat> but it, it's, um, it's involved tracking um, cases, tracking fatalities, trying to keep tabs on the 12 or 13 hospitals within the county, um, trying to stay connected to their emergency rooms and see what their needs are, trying to stay connected to their um, their administrative teams and see what their needs are. Um, I mean, I could spend the next hour talking about the roles of the health division right. in the context of a pandemic. There are a lot of moving parts. Correct. I can only imagine. Where do you guys get most of your information from the local hospitals, um, from the CDC? Where do you guys kind of pull from everywhere, everything? Well, I, 
for us, everywhere, everything. Um, okay. we, we use two primary guidelines or um, guiding sources uh, to establish our policies. We don't, we don't establish our policies independently, or at least we try not to officially. Um, we generally follow CDC guidelines and we follow MDHHS or Michigan Department of Health and Human Services guidelines. Okay. Um, you know, there, uh, just for example, there was a national emergency declared, then a state emergency, and then a, um, a local um, you know, county emergency. And okay. each one of those uh, cascading uh, events has with it a number of um, responsibilities and, um, and actions and, you know, associated with them. Um, and, and in fact, really dec those, dec those declarations often don't change behavior, what we do, but what we have access to. That is, we have access to, for example, national stockpiles from FEMA or, um, or grants for our businesses, that sort of thing. Um, and that, that's why I think generally states make those declarations or counties make those declarations. Um, but we, we try to follow CDC guidelines primarily with modifications by state. We rely on MDHHS um, advisories to help um, to help motivate uh, local populations for, for example, social distancing or mm -hmm. shutting down businesses and um, limiting activities to uh, only essential services, that sort of thing. Um, if we make those uh, declarations ourselves independently, um, I'm not sure they're taken quite as seriously as if they come down from a higher authority. Right, correct. I think yeah. we saw that here in Michigan. Yeah, and uh, our nurse on call, I just wanna make a shout out uh, to them. Our yeah. nurse on call, uh, they can be reached at 1-800-848-5533. And we pull from those MDHHS guidelines, those CDC guidelines, and there's a lot of things that people might hear on the news um, that uh, sometimes is conflicting information. And sometimes people just need help in interpreting the information or I heard this, but I also heard this. How can I, uh, what should I do? And those nurse on call, they're there right now from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And Saturdays and Sundays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. answering those calls. And so they can lots of times be that person that can help uh, you have a conversation as to find out what's the best course of action and how to interpret those guidelines. Wow, yeah, great. Thanks, thanks for including that. Um, I, I should point out that actually Shane uh, oversees and coordinates the nurse on call staff and, and okay. the information that they have in terms of answering questions, but they're a great resource. So it's important that yeah. we include that in the call. That's a wonderful resource, thank you. So let's kind of get into the COVID stuff. Uh, what are the symptoms? What can we expect to see if you think you have it? You know, everybody walks around and if they cough, everybody stops, you know, we immediately move away. Um, so Good. what are the symptoms that we're seeing? Yeah. Well, the, the classic triad of symptoms was were fever, cough, shortness of breath. But in fact, if you if you now that we have data accumulating, not just from China, but but within the United States, mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, only approximately 50% of folks that are infected with COVID ever really develop a fever. And the symptom profile can range anywhere from some sniffles, a very mild cold, you know, exhibiting the sniffles and maybe a little sneeze or a little bit of cough, really not anything else, um, all the way out to full blown serious respiratory failure. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we've heard people, um, present with GI distress or symptoms, flu-like GI symptoms, or uh, sore throat. So all of those things certainly fall within the, the COVID constellation of symptoms. Um, and, and this time of season, allergies. Uh, I've had lots of conversations with people where they're trying to figure out, is it allergies or do I have COVID-19? And it might just be allergies, but the conversation I've always told them is, assume the worst. And if, if you're not essential, 
you should not be around other people and you should not be going out. And if you are an essential worker and you think it might be allergies, but you're not sure, err on the side of caution and work with uh, your um, employer to, to not come in that day until you can get in touch with your healthcare provider to kind of uh, sort that out. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you think you may have something and you don't know if it's allergies or you don't know if it's COVID-19, you should contact your physician. And assume, you know, there's no downside into assuming that it is COVID right now and isolating yourself. Correct. It, it, we know for a fact that COVID-19 is widespread in our community right now. Um, you know, a month or two ago, the majority of patients appearing in the emergency room with this constellation of symptoms had flu. Now, 3% or fewer have flu and more than 90% have COVID. We just need to assume that this is in the, in the community and, um, and you may have COVID. Isolate yourself, stay away from you know, elderly folks or the vulnerable population in your household. And um, you know, you know, even if it's not COVID, let's say it's the flu, there's still no downside in isolating yourself and preventing spreading flu around or whatever other virus you may have. Right. At what point should you seek medical attention? Should you go to the hospital? You know, the hospitals were flooded two weeks ago. We could see lines at Royal Oak Beaumont just driving by on 13 Mile. Yeah, I mean, early on, people were so afraid, and, um, and rightly so. You know, this is a, a scary new phenomenon in a pandemic, so that, that's a new, a new experience. Um, but, I mean, I guess the question would be, if it were something else, when would you go to the hospital and seek emergency care? Right. Those are the same guidelines right now. If you're okay. truly having trouble breathing, if your symptoms are worsening and you're having trouble breathing, then it's time to seek care. Um, but otherwise, you know, if, if you can shelter at home and shelter in place, um, you don't need emergency care. And, um, and we, we really need to make a strong effort to decompress our emergency rooms right now. Unfortunately, those places that are hotspots, those, um, those hospitals and those emergency rooms are, are very congested and essentially have turned into intensive care wards. You know, they have ventilators lined up with intubated patients, and now they have tents in the, in the parking lots where they're triaging, um, you know, otherwise people that would otherwise come to the emergency room. Some of those are the worried well, and they go to one tent and they're educated and evaluated and maybe go home. Some are, are ill with non-COVID issues and are kept away from COVID patients, and they're evaluated and assessed and perhaps are admitted to the hospital. But as much as you can, it's important to try to stay away from the hospitals. And I think that I think that message has gone out successfully because when we talk to the hospitals right now, the number of um, non-COVID and um, less serious issues really are not showing up and, and you know, kind of uh, jamming their ERs right now. And I just want to echo what Dr. Faust has said, that our nurse on call has spoken to a lot of people who base their decisions on whether or not they got tested for COVID-19, what those test results were, or they weren't able to get tested. And so they, they base their decisions on that test, that test result, or that lack thereof testing. And when really they should be basing those medical decisions on the severity of the symptoms that they're experiencing. Like Dr. Faust said that regardless of what your test results were or if you were able to get tested, if you are sick enough where you need medical attention, where you would normally go get that medical attention, go get that medical attention. If you normally otherwise wouldn't, then the best thing to do and the best course of action is to stay home, self-isolate, not just from others outside your home, but as much as you can from those inside your home as well, sleeping in a separate room, using a different bathroom, um, uh, wearing a mask if you're ill, even if it's a homemade mask while you're at home can help reduce uh, the uh, risk of whatever it is you have, even if it's not COVID-19, to other people in your household. Okay. 
So Shane, you mentioned masks and, you know, staying in different bathrooms and different bedrooms and stuff. So how does this exactly spread? I know there was a lot just talking about droplet in the beginning, and then they thought maybe this could be airborne. What, what do we know? Well, we know that the closer you are for the, for a longer amount of time to somebody who has COVID-19, the more likely you are to get it. Um, right. Uh, you know, the only way you can reduce your risk to zero of catching COVID-19 is if you are in your house by yourself and you don't let anybody else in or you yourself don't go out. Um, and that's for, for some people who, you know, that's just not realistic. We live with other people. Some of us work in essential jobs and we have to go uh, provide those services. Um, and so it's about re putting in layers of prevention to get that risk as close to zero as possible. And so we know that COVID-19 is turning out to be a little more infectious than we thought. Um, uh, a lot of people have heard the, and, and actually now is, uh, a lot of people are familiar with the term are not, uh, which is for every person that is infected with uh, a disease, how many other people do they infect? And uh, COVID-19 that originally was thought to be around two. Now that might be a little higher. There was an article that just came out in the Emerging uh, Infectious Disease Journal out of the CDC. And so uh, I think those numbers that other people, however many people an affected person can infect, that are not number, it can change. It can vary. Um, the more people that are infected with it and become immune, uh, the more prevention steps that people take, social distancing, it can lower that R not number. And so I think how infectious a disease is, is determined upon people's behavior. Uh, however, COVID-19, um, it, it can be fairly infectious. There's more evidence coming out that you potentially can be infectious prior to becoming symptomatic. And that's why it's so important to do the social distancing, to take these precautions, even if you think you're well, and to assume that you potentially could be infectious to somebody else. Okay, thank you, yeah. So we I just keep want hearing, to say, yeah. I just wanna say it's awesome that he's an epidemiologist and brought up the notion of R0 or R0. I think that's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why the two weeks, gentlemen? What what is the science, if you don't mind me asking, about this 14 days? Everyone's like, oh, 14 days. Okay, I'll feel better in 14 days. What was the evidence-based practice, if you have any, behind that? Well, I, I know I've had this conversation with a lot of people because I've been working with uh, essential service providers, uh, okay. for example, somebody who is tested positive for COVID-19 and they were sick or maybe they had a mild case. When can they go back to work? When can they go back to work safely and uh, no longer be a risk to others? And I think originally when uh, the pandemic really started here in the United States, I think uh, this 14 day notion uh, came about from the incubation period of uh, COVID-19. The incubation period or the period of when you're infected to when you could show symptoms is anywhere from two to 14 days. And so people would say, oh, you may have been exposed to COVID-19. You should stay home and stay away from others and quarantine yourself on the possibility that you might get sick. Well, some people actually did get COVID-19. I think there was some recommendations out there. And I think just in the beginning, uh, they kind of uh, just kind of got the two mixed together. And they said, oh, Stay home for 14 days if you get sick, and that's fine. That is, you know, probably a good thing to do. Um, I think that the longer you can stay away from others when you're sick, it's, it's good. But uh, there's chances that you're not infectious for, like, 14 days, just period, dot. Uh, nature doesn't work that way. Viruses don't work right. that way. Some people are going to be... Uh, infectious for a shorter period of time if they had a very mild case and other people are going to potentially be infectious for longer if they have a, a moderate or a severe case. And so again, I think how long somebody is infectious 
we're still trying to figure that out and there's no real good solid uh, abundance of evidence that says exactly how long you're infectious, but we are minimally recommending that people who are COVID-19 positive or think they are stay away from others for up to three days after you your symptoms, your respiratory symptoms are resolved. And that's just out of an abundance of caution and uh, out of a concern that some people might, uh, um, you know, feel good one day and feel bad the next and feel good one day. And if they go out on that day that they thought they were all better, they really mm-hmm. would have been. Okay. The, the basis for all that is that um, studies have demonstrated that the, uh, the viral load and viral shedding very much parallel uh, symptoms. So yes, there are rare cases that have been demonstrated where there's been transmission from one person who becomes COVID positive prior to their symptom onset. Okay. okay. That's fairly rare though. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, the amount of virus that we can test from somebody that the amount of virus they're shedding, their viral load, very much parallels the severity of their symptoms. And so as they progress through the clinical course and become more and more symptomatic, the amount of virus that they're shedding increases. Um, And the difference between, let's say, um, someone who has very minimal symptoms and someone who has severe symptoms, the difference in viral load is 50 or 60 fold. So it's it's very significant. And so as, as your symptoms resolve, as your immune system kicks in and starts to clear virus, uh, your viral shedding uh, decreases as well. Ah, okay. So why do we keep hearing about all the hospital workers? Everyone's scared they're good, that they're going to get this, that, you know, most hospitals do have the proper PPE right now. Everyone's wearing masks and face shields and gowns and hair nets and such. Um, but there's still that fear of, you know, these nurses, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. So what's kind of going on there? Were they just ex- could they have been exposed and didn't know it? Could they? Could we be talking about this three-day window where they feel better so they go back to work? You know, I, I, I have to question your premise that they have plenty of personal protective equipment. Okay. So, you know, I, yeah, that I, is I true. hear from emergency room physicians and nurses and, and frontline folks that, frankly, they, they don't have adequate personal protective equipment. Let's just call it PPE. Correct. Assume it's that includes masks and shields and gowns. Okay. We know that there's still a national deficit, a national need for okay. PPE. And so um, the stories that I hear from those frontline healthcare providers is that they may have only one mask being provided by the hospital for several days. And, you know, those for example, N95s mm-hmm. in a contagion situation, they're intended to be one mask worn when you evaluate a single patient and then discard it. And then when you go to see the next patient, another mask applied. That's not happening. So to say they have plenty of you know personal protective equipment is probably misleading. Okay. I, know, I know the hospitals like to project that air okay. of confidence and competence. And I think that's great. Um, but I think, I think we have easy explanations for why nurses and physicians and frontline providers are becoming ill. Um, mm-hmm. Because those, those masks were not intended for you know, extended wear or reuse. Now, CDC has issued a guideline. Clearly, CDC is aware that we don't have enough PPE for the country. And right, so correct. they've issued, you know, guidelines, you know, because hospitals were just demanding to have that, that question answered. What do we do now? We've got one mask. I, this is all I have for the entire week. You know, how do I manage? And right. CDC issued guidance saying, you know, guidance for extended wear and reuse. Um, there are stories, in fact, out there of uh, frontline uh, providers washing their N95s, and they're just not made to do that. And so right. now there are uh, there are options for UV irradiation to eliminate to kill virus or um, other sterilization methods. Um, there are vendors that manufacturers that provide those to the hospitals right now. So those you know those things 
help with extended wear, but there's still not enough. Now, the national stockpile has not provided adequate uh, supplies for our hospitals. Right. Um, we turn around, you know, when everything that we receive um, from the federal government through the state to county here, we turn around and distribute within 24 hours. Um, you know, our, our materials management and our emergency preparedness team is literally doing, you know, all-nighters trying to get this stuff divvied up and redistributed to our hospitals. So they, they're getting everything available, mm -hmm. but honestly, it's not enough. Okay. And so I'm jump in real quick. I'm sorry. Sorry. I had a question. Um, now, as a, I was an ICU nurse in my background. Now, when I would come home, it's that natural inclination to, you know, leave your shoes in the garage. You dump your scrubs right into the washing machine. Um, you know, you don't bring your medical equipment into the house. How much of that do the general population now need to adapt? Do they need to leave their shoes outside? Do they need to come in and take a shower right away? I mean, how much should they start jumping in and, you know, how much that's a, that's, infectious could be on them? Yeah. yeah, that you know, that's a great question. And, and we frankly don't have a great answer for that. Using an, an abundance of caution, I would see no problem with the general public doing those things. I do those things right now when I go out and I, you know, I go out to nursing home and test somebody. I'll do a swab. I'll put on PPE, but you know that set of clothes um, doesn't come back to the office with me. Doesn't go home with me. It goes straight into the washing machine, and I change immediately and go shower. Um, and you know, and you know, I just, and I go ahead. Well, I, I mean, um, right now I know our our frontline providers are doing those things as much as possible. Of course, their exposure is much greater. They're seeing you know, uh, potentially dozens of patients through the day, many of whom are COVID positive. So certainly their uh, viral load, if you will, on their exterior is certainly greater than the person who puts on a surgical mask and goes to the grocery store, for example. But even so, there's no downside into taking great precaution in this, in this pandemic. And I think that, again, situations that we're getting uh, called into our on, nurse on call, a good example is somebody who has any number of the high risk conditions. Maybe they have a history of heart disease. Maybe they uh, uh, have asthma as well on top of uh, some other things. Um, or they have an immunocompromising condition. and they're or, or live with somebody at home who meet those conditions as a vulnerable person. Right. And they want to know, I am an essential worker. I am still going out or I'm the one that is going to get groceries. I don't want to bring something back to that person who, should they get it, is at a much greater increased risk of having a severe illness. And so I think all the points that Dr. Faust is making about it is never a bad thing to take an abundance of precaution especially when you have those kinds of situations, those kind of living situations. Another situation is um, uh, somebody who might be elderly, uh, but they have a grandson or a son or daughter in the area who brings them groceries. Um, and otherwise they're not going to get that food. How do they go about, you know, taking that delivery? Um, it might be hard, but sometimes you might just have to leave it on a porch for somebody to pick it up and not actually see that uh, grandmother or that father that you would normally maybe go on a weekly basis and check in on them. Uh, you really want to, you know, for those people at greater risk, if they're a loved one that you have who has those compromising conditions, you really, it's not a bad thing to go that extra mile. You might think this sounds, it might sound a little silly, but that's when you want to do it is when it might feel a little silly because then you're going to take that extra level of prevention and precaution. So with that, like with the deliveries, there's a lot of grocery delivery services, pickups, that type of stuff. A lot of people are asking, you know, do I need to wipe down my Amazon boxes? Do I need to let them sit there for 48 hours before I touch them? Uh, there's a lot of questions as to that. Can you guys comment on that a little bit? Um. I can say this, early studies suggest that the, 
cr this coronavirus can live on surfaces, hard, you know, uh, metal surfaces or plastic surfaces, for example, up to 72 hours, and on cardboard surfaces for several hours. Um, I will tell you what we do at our house um, based on that limited information that we have. When we have Amazon boxes delivered, we let them sit for at least a day, often a day, a couple of days before we bring them in and, and start, you know, handling those items. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today. I want to end with one final question. Um, since you are the Oakland County Health Department, what is your best um, recommendation for a hand sanitizer for, you know, we hear a lot of like, oh, we have to use the Lysol, we have to use Clorox, it has to be with bleach. You know, what is your recommendation on that? Um, let me start. I'm sure Shane will have some, some comments as well. Um, I think the, there's good news and bad news with this particular coronavirus. And there, there are over 400 strains of or species of this of coronavirus. Um, so there's many of these. But for this particular SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 coronavirus, um, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is it's easily transmitted between people, okay? Um, the so-called attack rate is fairly high. And the bad news is we don't have endemic immunity. We apparently have not had this coronavirus exposed to us before. We haven't built, you know, an immune system against it. So that's the bad news, and which is why we see the spread that we see. The good news with regard to disinfection is that it's a fairly fragile virus. That is, it doesn't live for a month on a hard surface. Um, it doesn't linger in the air for a day or two. This is great news. And in fact, for all the disinfectants, they're all effective. Number one, soap and water. Frequent hand washing with soap and water. Simple, everybody's got soap and water. Do that as often as you can. Um, and all the other disinfectants, uh, the hand uh, sanitizers, 60% or above in alcohol. And for surfaces, virtually anything works. Bleach cut one to two, um, the alcohol base, the, um, the uh, cyclohexidine based, virtually all the surface disinfectants work just fine. Um, so it doesn't really, you know, require anything heavy duty or special. There are other emerging pathogens mm -hmm. that are much hardier and require, okay. you know, more stringent um, uh, attack. Yeah. And uh, I'll just add to that is that um, that is a great great thing. the The virus is what we call an an envelope virus. It has a fragile um, casing uh, that it needs to get into somebody's uh, cell, and uh, that's broken up uh, pretty easily uh, with any kind of disinfection. However, we need to use them properly. You know, if you wash your hands, you need to use that soap and water. You need to wash your hands for the appropriate amount of time. If you use a surface disinfectant, don't just spray it and then wipe it off uh, right away. You know, let it sit there, give it a chance to do its thing for um, a few seconds, according to the manufacturer's guidelines. I know when I'm disinfecting surfaces in my home, whether it's bleach or alcohol based, I'll spray that surface, I'll walk away, I'll go spray another surface, and then I come back and then I wipe down that first uh, surface to give that disinfectant an opportunity to work. It's good if you have it. It's good that they work. You just want to make sure you use them properly so that they can do uh, their job that they were due to kill viruses and bacteria. Okay, great. Thank you, gentlemen, so much, Dr. Foss and Shane. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. I know you guys are very busy trying to keep our whole county and state healthy. So I really appreciate that you're taking the time to talk with us today. You're welcome. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Maggie. That concludes our section of Boomer Health today at home. Uh, everyone have a great day and we will see you tomorrow.